Hello and welcome to this lecture on voice tremor. My name is Linda Sandström. I am a speech language pathologist working at Umeå University Hospital. In this lecture, we will look at voice tremor in patients with essential tremor. What characterizes voice tremor in these patients? How do we evaluate voice tremor and how can it be treated? Voice tremor is the second most common non-mandatory symptom of essential tremor, just after head tremor. But the reported prevalence actually varies a lot between studies, from 12% up to as much as 62%. Why some patients develop voice tremor and some don't is not well understood. But there are some indications of voice tremor being more common in older patients and in patients with more severe hand tremor. And of course, essential tremor is a very heterogeneous condition, and it could be that patients developing voice tremor make up a specific subtype. Patients with voice tremor often report a gradual onset of the symptom and a slow progression over time. And this fact suggests that voice tremor is likely to progress just like tremor in other body parts or bodily functions. The specific characteristics of voice tremor are involuntary rhythmic or near rhythmic oscillations in frequency, that is pitch, and amplitude, that is loudness. And these oscillations will cause the voice to sound tremulous and shaky. Voice tremor should not be confused with vocal instability. These are two different voice symptoms, even if they can coexist. Vocal instability lacks the rhythmicity of tremor and is often perceived as more unpredictable in that way. Voice tremor can originate from anywhere within the speech apparatus, that is the respiratory, the phonatory and the articulatory subsystems, even if laryngeal tremor is most common. Regarding the distribution of voice tremor, one study found that individuals with severe voice tremor were more likely to have tremor affecting several of the speech subsystems. In clinical practice, however, we seldom perform such examinations, and so therefore we don't know exactly where the patient's voice tremor originates from. Voice tremor is best perceived during a sustained phonation task. This is because when we speak, we often speak at such a fast rate that voice tremor is concealed. But of course, it is also important to listen to connected speech to get an understanding of how voice tremor might affect a person's communication in everyday life. When you ask your patient, patients to prolong an ah, uh, always instruct them to use their everyday normal voice, that is, at a normal pitch and loudness level. Don't encourage them to sing, because that can make them use a higher pitch and more airflow than they would if they were producing speech. Also, as I said before, keep in mind that voice tremors should not be confused with vocal instability. These are two separate symptoms, kind of like tremor and ataxia. You will now hear a recording of a patient that I consider to have more vocal instability than tremor. If you listen closely, there are some semi-rhythmical tremulous movements towards the end of the recording, but I would still consider this patient as having predominantly vocal instability even if it's very mild. we we'll listen to it again. Another important aspect to consider during evaluation is that healthy voices are seldom entirely stable either, and it can be difficult at times to distinguish subtle voice tremor from normal movements in the vocal system. Here is a recording of myself, and you will hear that my voice is far from stable here. So if I were to give you an advice on how to distinguish voice tremor from other types of vocal movements, it would be listen to the rate and regularity of the oscillations. Voice tremor should be fairly rhythmical and at a rate of approximately 4 to 7 hertz. This is a recording of a patient with very slow tremor. You can almost hear that the respiratory muscles must be affected in some way. Here is a recording of a patient with a more typical voice tremor rate. So 
So how does DBS help patients with voice tremor? Well, the overall results so far suggest that DBS can be effective in about 50% of cases, but there is large variability in outcomes. Why is that? Well, a definite answer to this question is perhaps a little too premature, but there are some factors that have been highlighted as indicators of treatment success. And these are bilateral stimulation as opposed to unilateral, more focused and precise stimulation within the DBS target, severity of voice tremor at baseline, and finally, that DBS may be more successful on voice tremor in younger patients. We will now take a closer look at each one of these factors possibly influencing the outcome with DBS. First, we consider the claim that voice tremor requires bilateral DBS. The rationale is that since the speech apparatus is innervated bilaterally, bilateral DBS must be required. However, we know that tremor symptoms are not always equally distributed between both sides of the body, so it's possible that unilateral stimulation could help in some cases. Also, there may be an ipsilateral effect of stimulation, which could also be beneficial. If we consider the more recent literature, there is more and more evidence suggesting that unilateral stimulation can suffice to treat voice tremor. And sometimes unilateral stimulation has been found to be as effective as bilateral. You will now hear a recording from one of our patients that participated in two of our studies on voice tremor from 2018 and 2019. This is the patient off stimulation. Uh, and this is the patient with bilateral stimulation. Uh, And this is the same patient with left-sided stimulation only. Uh, In this particular case, I would say that unilateral stimulation was successful on the patient's voice tremor. The second factor that has been highlighted as important for successful results relates to the location and strength of stimulation. And according to the current state of knowledge, it may be that voice tremor requires more focused stimulation compared to hand tremor. For example, Matsumoto and colleagues found that voice tremor required more precise VIM stimulation compared with hand tremor, and that stimulation spread into neighboring thalamic regions was associated with persisting voice tremor. Kundu and colleagues found an association between effective voice tremor reduction and stimulation origin in the VIM. Our group have demonstrated that high amplitude stimulation can aggravate or even induce voice tremor in patients who otherwise have good effect at lower stimulation levels in the PSA. It is also our clinical impression that patients who have an excellent effect with PSA DBS generally improve at very low stimulation level, often lower than what is required to treat their hand tremor. Regarding the influence of baseline severity, the reports are inconsistent. Some have found that individuals with more severe voice tremor also have the largest improvements with DBS. Others have found no association between the degree of voice tremor and the subsequent treatment result. And finally, just to complicate things, in our latest study on voice tremor, we found that patients with more severe voice tremor had more modest improvement compared to those for whom voice tremor was completely resolved. In any case, when evaluating these findings, it is important to reflect a bit upon what the authors consider to be an improvement. Is it when voice tremor is completely resolved or is it when it's improved by 50%? or by 75%. This will, of course, affect the study's conclusions. Finally, it has been suggested that patients' age could affect the outcome and that voice tremor is more likely to persist in older patients. However, more studies are needed here. 
One aspect that has not received any attention as of yet is whether GBS outcomes could be dependent upon where voice tremor resides. As mentioned previously, voice tremor can arise from respiratory, phonatory and articulatory muscles, and the more structures that are involved, the more severe the voice tremor. So the question remains, does it matter which speech subsystems are involved and how many? Can DBS be more effective in alleviating voice tremor in one structure than in another? To investigate such questions, one would need to examine the patients more closely using, for example, fiber optic nas nasolaryngoscopy. I will round off with some concluding remarks and take home messages. When you evaluate voice tremor, don't confuse voice tremor with instability. Listen for rhythmicity and consider the rate of oscillations in the voice. Regarding DBS as a treatment for voice tremor, it is possible that voice tremor is less forgiving in the sense that it may require more focused stimulation compared with hand tremor. So you should perhaps not expect to get a better result on voice tremor by increasing the amplitude. In fact, increasing the amplitude may be counterproductive and instead aggravate the symptom. Also, don't assume that bilateral DBS is required in all cases. There is quite a lot of evidence now suggesting that unilateral DBS can be effective. This concludes my lecture. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to contact me at this email address. Thank you.